Bibles this morning to the book of Acts, chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we'll be reading from 42 through 47. The heading above this little paragraph is the fellowship of the believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. I'm almost out of breath. Took Blake up to class and had to run back down here to be here. Uh, following the theme, the man standing before you is not bringing the lesson. <laughs> um, Edison was supposed to, he was scheduled to, but uh, Delta had some equipment problems in El Salvador yesterday, so his flight was canceled. He is on his way back, but he's not going to make it for right now. So, knowing that was always a slight possibility, his son-in-law, Pedro, is going to bring us a lesson today, and I think that is going to be a great blessing. Uh, he is a very merciful and gracious young man, and I will let you understand that because I'm going to ask him to tell you his last name. He told me I didn't have to tell you. So uh, I will let Pedro come up and present us the lesson, but I just kind of thought you might want a little understanding of what was going on. So Edison's on his way, and, but not today. So enjoy. Pedro. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here with you guys today, even though it was basically Edison's fault. Um, but, but yeah, I, every time I, I get to... Can I just put this like this? Okay, nice. Um, every time I get to preach or teach, it's, it's, I just love it, right? Um, this is what I, what I like to do. Um, my last name is Moko, which is kind of hard to pronounce for almost every American that I know. So yeah, Chuck, um, couldn't say it. Um, but, but just for, me, for you to know a little bit about me, you know that I'm Edison's son-in-law, and I was born and raised in Caracas. Well, in Venezuela, I was born in Caracas, Venezuela. My parents are here, so. That's a blessing. Um, as you probably know, Venezuela is a mess, so many of us just left the country, and I was one of those lucky ones for a different reason, right? It's because I saw a picture of Edison's daughter on Facebook, and I said, yeah, that's for me. So the excuse was, the excuse was, hey, girl, I need to learn English. So it worked. I did learn English. Um, so, and yeah, I got married too, so we're here, I've been here for the last 10 years, and five years here in actually Mesa Church, it's in the other side of the building, right? Um, but I, I had the opportunity to, and the privilege of actually studying here um, in the United States in college. I went to Harding University, maybe some of you know that, and I basically study, you know, theology, ministry, and that kind of thing, because that's my passion, right? So. Um, I know you guys have like you're serious on the whole thing that you're talking, but I hope that this um, sermon can bless you, bless you in some way. So the, the sermon today is titled Walking in the Storm, right? And I, and I think this sermon is going to be really, really important. And the idea of this sermon is that tomorrow you can be a different person, right? That tomorrow you can do something different. Church is not just about coming on Sunday, but what you're going to do tomorrow, right? And that is, that's what I'm expecting for this sermon to be with you. So I heard somebody say that we live in the hallway of a hospital, right? 
um, that, that our entire life, spend time in life, we just go back and forward in this hospital, right? We live between these white walls, and there are many doors in that hallway. And these doors are the ones that from time to time open a different chapter in our life, right? So at one point, you know, one door opens and we experience the joy of a newborn baby, right? I mean, we're happy, we're excited, we're jumping around. I'm about to experience this in two months, actually, because my baby girl is coming. So we're super excited about that. We have two kids, by the way, but the two boys, they told me that girls are completely different. I already told my, my wife that I'm not parenting that girl. She's going to manipulate me that she wants. But we talk and we say she's not dating anybody, right? So, ever. So, so but yeah, that, that's life, right? We, we experience the joy and the happiness. I mean, you, God bless us. It's just an amazing time at that time. But there are other times in our life where other door opens and now there's no happiness. The doctor just told you that you have cancer and there's nothing you can do about it. You see, it's in this hallway of life in which the good and the bad, the sunny days and the not so sunny days meet each other and we walk back and forward between both. Some points in our life, we can barely believe how happy we are and at other points we can even understand how great is our pain. And that's our life. And I can tell you without fear of being wrong that if you ask anybody to tell you the story of the best day of their life, it might take a little, right? But they will tell you. Because it doesn't matter how bad your life was or is, all of us have the chance to experience a great day. You know, a great moment. Maybe your wedding, maybe uh, your birthday, right? Maybe that time that you have this meeting with this relative that you have a long time without seeing. Or maybe just a time at home, you know, where everything was just perfect. Everybody has those days. But if you ask anybody to tell you about the worst day of their life, they will also tell you that. Because all of us experience bad situations in our life. All of us suffer in this life. We experience the good and the bad. The days of clear skies and the days of storms. And I don't know you, right? This is the first time that I'm here, but I know you relate to what I'm saying. Because you're experiencing it in your life too. All of us experience the same thing. And somebody say that we need the rainy days to really appreciate the sunny days, right? The problem is the sunny days are not the issue, you know? Because when, when the, the door of, you know, the room of goodness of life, you know, every hap, everything is happy, pink skies, you know, you're bear singing around and everything is gray, you enter and you enjoy that room. Freely, there is nothing to worry about. The problem is the time in this ugly and sad room in which the skies are dark and the storm seems unbearable. This is where our life gets crushed. This is where our lives change. Even though the, the time in this room is just a fraction of the time in those other happy rooms. Even though we know we live in a broken world, right, that sooner or later, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, something is going to happen. Still, these times of storms destroy us. That is life for each one of us. Well, we cannot spend our time thinking about these days, right? That will be miserable. What I'm trying to tell you is that these days of storms are going to come just for the mere nature of our existence here on earth. So the question is, not if storms are going to come, but what are you going to do when that happens? So today I want to talk to you about the storm that changed the life of 12 men. We're going to be reading in Matthew 14. Matthew 14, starting in verse 24, but before going to the text, right, you can start looking for it. Matthew 14. Let me tell you a little bit about what is going on here. John the Baptist was recently beheaded, right? Um, you know, so the people is excited, right? They want revenge. And then suddenly the Bible tells us that Jesus go to another part of the lake, but people follow him. So Jesus feel compassion for these people, you know, heal the sick, fed the 5,000. And then people after that, people is convinced that this is the guy, right? This is the Messiah. This is the guy that's supposed to save us. And in John, actually, we read that he says that they wanted to make him their king. So there was a lot of excitement in the environment. So Jesus, I don't know why, he get the apostles, right? Put her on a boat and tell them to go. Then he dismissed the crowds and he goes to a certain place to pray for a long time. And the night came. Today, our focus is going to be here with the apostles, right? But in the meantime, they are alone in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. 
And we don't know what is happening, but please let me tell you my, my perspective of this situation here, right? We don't know if they were maybe confused about the whole situation, maybe frustrated because Jesus, you know, uh, let them go. Maybe they were worried about Jesus' safety. Who knows? But what I can tell you is that I think, I think the one thing they don't want is to be here alone in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Because at a certain point, I believe, they start feeling a little uneasy about what is going on around them in the environment. Remember something. Some of these guys are fishermen. So they know the sea, this sea in particular. So I like to think that at a certain point, they start smelling something in the environment, right? Like something is different here. It's not, it's not right. They start seeing the wind, you know, moving like way too fast and way too strong. The water under the boat start moving and the boats are moving with the wave. And then they start rowing really bad, really hard, right, to try to get out of that situation because maybe there's still time, but then the clouds cover the sky. And then fear start, start to set inside of them. But they say, you know what? Maybe there's still a chance to get out of this. But Peter, <laughs> Peter, Peter is freaking out. Peter knows this sea like the palm of his hand, right? He knows this sea and he knows a storm is about to break out. So, so like to confirm his thought, you know, <laughs> lighting in the sky and somebody opened the heavens just rain and start pouring down and the next second the apostle finds himself in the middle of a great storm freaking out for their life right they think they're going to die and the worst part of all you know what it is that they are without jesus because just before they were with jesus right this guy previously stopped a similar storm stopped the winds stopped the wave saved their life but now Jesus is not around. They're facing this storm by themselves. So I want for us to put ourselves in, in their shoes, right, in this situation. Because honestly, even though we don't experience that kind of physical storms, there's not much difference in the storms that we experience in our life, right? And there's something we can learn. And at the end, I think this is going to lead us to three key principles that I think we can apply in our life tomorrow, right, when we're facing Storm. So let's start reading uh, Matthew 12, verse 24. This is, this is what it says. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the wave, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, three to six in the morning, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. I mean, just think about this for a second, right? You're in the middle of the night in, in a lake, right, that is going ballistic, right? In a little boat, in the middle of a storm, and you see a thing walking on water. I mean, of course they're freaking out. It's not like you jump on water and try to swim. That thing is walking. It's going to get you, right? Sooner or later, it's going to get you. There is no, go no going out of that. But, but now, right now, let's not reduce the level of terror of the storm Itself. So let's remember, these guys are fishermen. And if you're a fisherman, you face the storms. It's just the way it goes, right? And if you're a fisherman, you, you learn what to do inside a storm, where you're going in, you know, what to do, what not to do. Most importantly, you learn not to freak out without a reason because your life depends on it. A uh, long time ago, the youth group where, where I was back there in Venezuela, we decided to take a trip, right, to this other state, you know, beautiful state, full of beaches. I mean, it was just a best place ever, right? So we go there, and we have a great time with the brothers over there, except for one day that I remember with pain. You see, the brothers there, they are fishermen. Now, don't picture fishermen like here in the United States, right? Like you have big boats and machinery. No, no, no. Picture Jesus type of fishermen, right? Like a little boat like this and just one motor. And that's it. That's what they use every day for living, right? So they tell us, well, we want to take you this tour, different islands. So we say, you know what? Let's go. 20 teenagers, we split in two. We go on this trip. Now, uh, until that day, I didn't know I am the kind of person that gets seasick pretty quickly. And um, let me tell you, I found out that motion sickness is not pretty, okay? So that day I actually puked twice going to these different places, and it was horrible. I spent the whole day feeling terrible. I regret it, right? But, but we were there, right? But, but at the end of the trip, you know, the, the, our fishermen brothers, knowing the whole situation, they tell us to, well, the sun is coming down. It's time to go back to land. So I wasn't feeling too good about it, right? Because by that time I was finally feeling better. But I said, you know what? 
Maybe it was a fluke, right? Maybe my body wasn't in the right place or whatever. Let's be positive here. Nope. After two minutes of I knew it was over, right? So sure enough, two minutes after, you know, third time, by the fourth time, all of the guys with the cell phones and, you know, taking pictures. Good thing, good thing we only have Facebook that time and not the other social medias, but it was embarrassing. Um, but the point is that coming back, right, um, from, from the trip, right, when the sun was coming down, um, we're, we're in the boat, right, everything is great, and then I heard, and then I, the boat stopped immediately, and I look back, the motor, the entire motor of the boat is like far away in the ocean. <laughs> like, I'm like, what is, I couldn't even believe what I was seeing. Now, the funny thing is that I realized immediately the boat was connected to the motor by a rope. So that made me think that my fisherman brothers knew about this detachment motor issue before even we got in there. So I wasn't happy about it. But they start pulling the, the motor, right? They put it on the thing and they start trying to, you know, make it work. But it just didn't work. It was full of water or whatever. They know what they were doing, right? So they finally turn on, but the motor is just not the same. It's just so weak. There's no power there. So they start talking, right? What are we going to do? We're going to just go one and then come back. And, and I'm like, I don't care. I mean, I'm like, they, right? I, I don't care if I have to paddle to land, right? I just want to be in solid ground where God makes us to be, you know, solid ground. At the end, after an eternity, they decide that we need to go. So we start, you know, the trick back. But it was so slow. The motor just, just couldn't take it, right? It was so slow that the night completely fell upon us. And I've never been in a situation like that. In the middle of the ocean, it's pitch black dark. You cannot see your hand in front of you. You just cannot see it. You need to touch your face to know your hand is there. It's that, that dark, right? The only light was a little flashlight in the, in, in the front of the other boat that was in front of me, right? So we were all freaking out, right? We were like, what is going to happen? You know, if we crash something, this is it, you know? We're praying. We're like saying goodbye to the world. It was bad. It was really bad. But what we noticed, and we noticed almost immediately, right, our fishermen brothers were scared, really scared. And we noticed it even more because when, we, when we're going like 10 minutes from land, I believe, there was this part where the boat needed to go to a specific way, right, because the corals, right, the rocks were really close to the surface. So you needed to do it in a, in a very specific way. And my brothers are like, you know, freaking out. Like, can you see that rock? I cannot see anything, man, it's way too dark. And they are still creaming each other, right? And they were freaking out about this whole situation. Thanks God, we make it safe, right, to land. Me almost passing out, but we make it, right? We make it there and, and we leave to tell the story. But what I noticed that day is that in the middle of the ocean, fear is real, even for fishermen, even for fishermen. So here are the apostles, right? Freaking out about their situation, thinking that they are going to die in the middle of this storm, facing them by themselves. And in the middle of this situation, Jesus talked in verse 27. He says this, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. <laughs> yeah, right. Whatever, right? And verse 28, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. Now, notice this. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. I mean, the whole situation is insane, right? But Peter heard this boy say, come. So Peter got out of the side of the boat, right? Passed his leg. Now, think for a second. This exact moment, how many things could Peter be thinking? We know he's scared. We know he's desperate. I mean, who in their sane mind is going to ask a figure to tell you to walk on water to get out of this mess? Nobody does that. Right? So it's easy for me to see the pain and desperation in Peter's voice when he said, if it's you, you know, let me walk on water right, with you. I just don't want to be here. And all of us heard these kind of stories, right? When people is completely desperate. And they do crazy things, you know? When people don't have any option, they just, they just react. And when I was creating this sermon, there was this image that I can never, you know, erase from my mind. It's from 9-11 World Trade Center. It's the jumping man, right? Somebody captured this guy facing down to his death in the middle of the air. And I can never check that from my head. Because, you know, I, they say that apparently 200 people, approximately 200 people, jumped to their death that day. And I saw a documentary about it. 
I mean, it's just horrible to think about it. But while I was watching it, I'm thinking, how desperate you have to be to decide to jump to your death. I mean, how much pain and suffering you have to feel to decide to jump, you know, knowing the consequences. And you see, life sometimes puts us in these places, right? Um, for the majority of us, it's not a physical situation, but a spiritual and emotional situation. When we feel like dying, you know, maybe a depression that never goes away. And at this point, you, you, you're not even thinking clearly about what life means. Maybe a breakup, a divorce, or a relationship that just got completely cut up, and you say, like, I wasted all of my time in this, so what do I do now? Maybe it's your spiritual walk with God that has been crushed so many times, you don't even know why you're here today. We are in these situations where we are desperate and we feel like dying. So here is Peter, right, in the side of the boat. Maybe he cannot even keep his balance. The water is moving right there, thinking so many things. Maybe picturing himself already drowning in the middle of the water, right? Having doubts, questions like, what the heck am I doing? Should I even go to here? Should I even trust in this? It's insane. Should I even, do I even want to take the risk of doing this? What I realize is that when the necessity of being with Jesus is greater than the risk you need to take, you will take that step of faith in the middle of your storm. Let me repeat that. When the necessity of being with Jesus is greater than the risk that you need to take, you will take that step of faith in the middle of the storm. When you can't do anything, when the doctor tells you that it's done, when there is no resources for this, when there is no hope at all, that's the moment when you will go to Jesus. And you will be forced to because that's the only option you have. There's no other way. I believe the people that jump from the World Trade Center, I think they consider the whole situation, right? They consider the risk and they jump. And I think as Christians, sometimes we just need to jump too. The, the great difference here, don't miss this, the great difference is that if you focus your desperation, your pain and your suffering on Jesus, on God, you won't be jumping to your death, but you will be jumping to life. And that is important for us to remember. So the first principle that I want to share with you today is this. Sometimes to get out of your storm, you will need to go deeper into it because Jesus is there. Sometimes to get out of your storm, you will need to go deeper into it because Jesus is there. You need to embrace your storm. You need to embrace your pain. I know that sounds crazy, but that's how it goes. There's no other way if you're a Christian. You know, when we have these moments that are bad in our life, we, we just don't like it. I mean, we're humans, right? We hate those moments. But the first thing we do is what? Where is God? Why is God not here with me? Why are you allowing this to happen to me, Lord? It's just not fair. But what you haven't realized is that Jesus is right there with you. You just haven't even noticed. You just need to open your eyes. He is right there with you. The Bible tells us and promises that he will be with us until the end. You just need to open your eyes and see it. I heard somebody say that sometimes God allows to touch rock bottom just for us to realize that he is the rock. And that's the reality of our Christian life. But um, many times we are like the rest of the apostles, right, in this storm. You know, they were also scared. They were also freaking out. And they saw Jesus too. But they didn't do anything. Peter was the only one who, you know, reacted. Granted, the craziest way, I give you that. But he was the only one who did anything. The rest of the apostles just stay here making a great mistake. Because the safest place is always where Jesus is. It's always with God. Doesn't matter what is your situation. Doesn't matter who you are. The safest place is always where God is. And that should teach you something too. The second thing, that, the second principle that I want to mention here that we learned from this story is, and you can help me with this, it's not about Jesus coming to us, it's about us going, let's repeat that. It's not about Jesus coming to us, it's about us going to Jesus. You know this thing, right? It's just, we just don't apply it, right? And sometimes we mess up this message, okay? Sometimes we mess it up for, for one reason, I think. I think part of the reason is this. Um, we live in a world that we created to please us in everything we want without us doing really anything. I mean, just think about it. If you want food, you're not gonna go hunt anything. You're not even gonna go to the store. Just get your phone, they put it on your door. If you want to cook, 
you know, your Instacart. If you want to get, have it already ready, you know, Uber Eats, right? Just get to your door right there. You don't have to do anything. If you want clothes, you don't have to go to a store anymore. You can just order online and it gets to your house, which is great for husbands because we don't have to go to the store with our wife. And the future generation will not know that. Um, so, so that is a good thing. But, but the future generation actually struggle with this, right? With this idea because and we, old people, man, I say old people, so that means that I'm old. But we always criticize, you know, these teenagers, right, kids, because they want great rewards with little effort. And we know that's not how the world works. And I'm not saying that you can't do this, right? If you want the food, the food to get to your door, just do it, right? It's easy. But the problem is that without noticing, we are getting involved in this culture of complacency in which we live, in which the best thing for you is not to do anything at all. And just think how this plays out in a marriage, right? Let's say that a husband just receive, receive, and receive, and receive, and does he give anything in return to his wife? I mean, I can be all cute and charming and all of that, but I'm sleeping in the couch. I mean, this relationship is eventually going to end. Because if I don't look to please my wife, if I don't look to, you know, take care of her needs, if I don't walk to her, then this relationship is not going to work out. And many times as Christians, we do the same thing with God. We neglect him, right? And we're just waiting for him to do his thing, and we decide not to do anything. And we need to understand that that's not how these work. It doesn't matter if it's a good day or a bad day. If we're smiling or we're crying, we always need to go to Jesus. To, cry, to, to, to have happiness in our hands or to ask for comfort, it doesn't matter. You need to go to Jesus, to God, at all times. And the third principle that I think is important for us, active faith in the middle of the storm is always going to end up with Jesus' company. Active, say active. There we go. Active faith in the middle of the storm is always going to end up with Jesus' company. It's not just about having faith. It's about being active inside your faith because the opposite is also truth. Passive faith in the middle of a storm will probably end up with you sinking. You know, going deeper into your storm, right? Walking to Jesus, to God, is not... It's not easy, right? This step of faith is just incredibly hard. It requires, you know, courage, faith, strength, and sometimes blood, sweat, and tears. And it's uncomfortable. Basically, all of the control we, him, we think we have in our life, we just put it in Jesus' hands, and we don't like that, right? As humans, we just don't like that. But the most important thing is that this active faith requires action, movement. If you don't move... Nothing is going to change. If you don't do something, nothing is going to change. One of my concerns in my life, because I experience it, and with the church, is that sometimes we ask for God's help, right? God, do this, and we just do. God is great, right? He can do whatever. And that's not how this works. God is not like a genie in the lamp, right? And say, hey, do this for me, and that's it. No, this is a relationship, in that relationship, both parts interact. If one of the parts don't do what they're supposed to be doing, that relationship is going to end. So we need to react the right way, going to Jesus, which means that you need to put your active faith on the ground. You need to take steps to make this happen. You know why? Because going to Jesus and being active in that crazy step is the only thing that is going to guarantee for you not to perish in the middle of your storm. That is the only thing that's going to get you out victorious out of your storm. There is no other way when you believe in God because you can sink in your boat. You know this. You know Christians that every day are sinking in their boat, right? Because they are not doing what we're supposed to be doing. We need to put an active faith on the ground because if not, we're going to sink. And this is exactly what happens to Peter's. To Peter, right? And you know the rest of the story, so let's read it here. Verse 30. But when he, Peter, saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him. Let me tell you something. Jesus, God, is never going to let you drown in the middle of your storm if you're looking for him. 
God is never going to let you suffer more than necessary if you're trying to be with him in the middle of your storm. He just won't let you. He will hold your hand before that happened. But this is the last part of the story, and this is the uncomfortable part. It's when Peter just doubt and fail. You know, Peter just moved his side a little bit, and he stopped believing. And then he begins to sink. And, uh, and the worst part actually comes with Jesus' words in verse 31, the second part. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Man, that has to hurt. I mean, after all that he did, you know, after stepping on faith, walking on water, he, he took at least two steps in the water, right? He walked on water, he just, you know, a little bit, he starts sinking, and Jesus is like, what? I mean, really? Why did you doubt? And that, that's Peter's mark for the rest of history. You know, he failed. He stopped believing in Jesus at that single moment when he, have, when he was out of his boat. So Peter failed at the end. That's not what I believe. I don't believe Peter failed. And I'm going to tell you why, for, for what he says in verse 32. And when they, Jesus and Peter, got into the boat, the wind ceased. Isn't it interesting to you that the storm still stopped? Even after the doubting, the falling, the looking away, the wind still stopped. The storm still stopped. They are still safe. So I don't, I don't care what people say. Maybe, maybe we can say that Peter failed. But he was the only man on earth beside Jesus who knows what is walking on water in the middle of his storm. I don't know. We can say that Peter failed. But he's the only one that night who faces his storm with Jesus. He's the only one that night who knew what is Jesus holding you to not drown in the middle of your storm. So to me, that's enough. That to me is not failing in the middle of my storm. So my question to you is this. What are you going to do when your storm comes? Or even better, what are you doing right now if their storm is right here? You can choose how to do this. You can do it on your own, or you can embrace your pain, embrace your storm, and go to God and hold his hand the entire time. Let me leave you with my favorite verse, John 16:33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have troubles, but take heart. I have overcome the world. God bless you. I have decided to follow.